Like I've had so many Britney Spears sermons in a certain era of my life where um, I, after a pastoral review, in the, I'd asked one, the congregation one question in part of the pastoral review, which was like, does Isaac have a theology? If so, what is it? And one person wrote, Isaac's theology is everything that Britney Spears has sang about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. One, two, ready, go. Welcome to the Called to be Bad podcast. My name is Mariah Martin, and I feel called to be bad. It turns out I'm not the only one. Join us as we dig into all things bad, scandalous, deviant, you know, the stuff that makes good church folks squirm in the sanctuary. Why? Well, because sometimes the scandalous is spiritual, deviant is divine, and bad is beautiful. Say yes to the call and let's see what holy trouble we get into today. Hello, Isaac. Hey, Mariah. Welcome to the podcast. So this is Isaac Vallegas. Um, Isaac is a child of Latin American immigrants, um, grew up in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands in the southwest corner of this country. Um, for the past 14 years, he has been the pastor of Chapel Hill Mennonite Fellowship. Isaac has worked as a con contributing editor at the Christian Century Magazine and writes regularly for the Anabaptist World Magazine. Um, he's also president of the North Carolina Council of Churches. Um, so welcome. And, and when I talk to Isaac, we've, we've never met in person, but I think, I feel like I've heard your name. Like, um, I'm sure I've read stuff that you've written. Um, but when uh, we got connected through um, Allison Brookins, um, a mutual friend, you'll hear that name a lot on this podcast. Um, I talked to Isaac and he said he wanted to talk about profane pop music, which I was very excited about. Um, I also am a fan of profane pop music. So yeah, before we dive into um, talking about pop music, uh, I'm curious what you are drinking today, Isaac. Yes, I mean, it is the morning still. <laughs> where, so I've, uh, I've been nursing my coffee um, because I knew that we'd be talking and um, I didn't want to caffeinate too much. So yeah. drink my coffee black, nice. pretty basic, uh, cook it on the stove, well, like one of those little stovetop espresso things. Um, but probably just as important as the drink itself is the, is the mug. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm very particular about which mugs I pick uh, from my cabinet, depending on how I'm feeling. Yes. Um, and this mug is made, is made by a friend of mine, Chris, one of my few friends uh, from high school who I'm still close with. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's an artist and does ceramics sometimes um, and made me this mug and it's beautiful. And I love to drink coffee out of it. Yeah, can you describe it for people listening to the podcast? Yeah, okay, to describe it with the <laughs> words. Um, it's, it's a short mug. Um, which is nice because that means, so I put my coffee in my thermos and then I just pour myself little bits at a time through the morning to make it last a long time. And so this little cup uh, makes it, doesn't, it doesn't like dwarf the little amounts of coffee that I drink at a time. So that's yeah. important. Um, it's a gray uh, unfinished uh, ceramic. Um, there's a finish on the inside, a glaze on the inside. Um, I imagine so that it protects it from the liquid. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, the ring, there's a ring for uh, the handle, which is basically enough for like one finger. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it has the only f uh, jagged or flat edges, straight edges of the whole mug. Everything else is very rounded. So it has an interesting mix of angles. Um, yeah, I just like to look at it and to drink out of it. Yeah, nice. It's beautiful. I, I I say it every single time and it's like I can't help myself, but I love coffee mugs and I love and tea mugs and I love learning about other people's. So um, today I have um, a mug. It's just a regular size mug with um, green and um, then orange stars. And sometimes I try to like find some weird connection between my mug and whatever we're talking about. And then I was like, I have nothing that has to do with like music or like pop or anything and then I was like oh pop stars <laughs> really perfect 
Thank you for laughing at that. That was a really bad joke. Um, and today I'm not drinking my regular coffee. I went on a hiking trip with my friend and I decided to take like instant coffee packets for, cause it would just be easier than taking some sort of French press or something. And so I got, I felt very fancy doing this, but I got the Four Sigmatic um, mushroom coffee mix with lion's mane. And this is the Ooh. Think Blend. Um, so it's instant coffee powder and lion's mane extract, which is a type of mushroom and organic chaga extract, organic, oh, I don't know how to say that, rhodiola, ro yeah. Anyways, so I'm drinking mushrooms in my coffee. That, um, but you that, said it's a think, a think blend. So that means we'll yeah. have to do some thinking this morning. Yeah, I didn't know that was part of the deal. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you can end it, the podcast now if, if that's an issue. <laughs> we can stop. Um, no, yeah, hopefully it means I'll, I don't know, be able to concentrate, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully Adderall will help with that too. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so as usual, we start with definitions and, you know, pop, profane pop music, like most people know what that is, but I thought it'd be kind of interesting to see how you would define profane and also like how you define pop music as a genre. Yeah, yeah, that's a, I was trying to think about that. Thanks for sending me that question ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, um, no problem. So, so yeah, I mean, I, maybe just to say that like, um, not only, so words have definitions, and those definitions um, are just kind of the surface level of a story. Sure. Um, every word has a story to it, they're always stories. So when I think of uh, profane, the word profane, I basically think of all the music that I got in trouble listening to when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that my parents um, did not like when they heard me listening to it in my room or in the car or whatever. Um, so, so, so yeah, all that music, basically any music that any uh, artist album that uh, could not be purchased at gospel supplies. <laughs> now, this, <laughs> this dates me a bit, but uh, when I was growing up, you know, there's, you don't really get music online. You had to go to the record store or whatever. And in our town, there was a place called gospel supplies, which just had um, Christian stuff, all Christian mm -hmm. music, books, whatever. And uh, yeah, so any music in there um, would be the non-profane music. <laughs> any music that I would get in trouble for listening to, like, I don't know, what was I? I remember getting in trouble listening to Violent Femmes. I don't know if okay. that, Violent Femmes or the Fugees. I remember I bought the Fugees album, The Score, and got in trouble for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's basically like for you, it was music that was not Christian and therefore had like, you know, curse words or uh, sexual references, any sort of explicit material. Or was it just like, even if it wasn't explicit, it wasn't Christian and so it wasn't okay? Yeah, I mean, it's basically just whatever I imagine my parents not liking me to listen to. Yeah. <laughs> they, they basically define the genre of what was allowable. And I am sure that they got references, innuendo, things that I did not even understand as like, you know, a kid. Yeah. <laughs> but I just knew that like, oh yeah, that stuff, that's profane. Uh, it doesn't belong yeah. in our household because this is a Christian house. Right. So instead, we had to listen to things like DC Talk, mm -hmm. you know, or Carmen, Petra, Jars okay. of Clay, you know, those Jars of things. Clay. I know Jars of Clay. I will say the, the only artist that I've found at Gospel Supplies and that I still listen to is Starflyer 59. So okay. if anyone's looking for some good music out there, I don't know what they would, <laughs> I don't even know if they would consider themselves like Christian artists or whatever, yeah. but. Starflyer 59, amazing album. I can't remember the name of the album. It was gold, bright gold. Someone out there listening to this is like, oh my gosh, I love that. Like totally hurting <laughs> out. Um, cool. And then, yeah, do you want to define pop music as, as a genre? Yeah, so pop music um, is based, so I, I should say, you know, that was like my early years. And then, you know, in high school, I did my modest form of rebelling. Mm -hmm. uh, which included going to um, Zia Records, okay. which was like, you know, the main record store in town. Um, 
and buying CDs that I wanted to listen to and just have, keeping them in my car, listening to them in my car. Um, and uh, basically pop music is any music that um, I would listen to that would come on the radio mm. and that I actually would not buy at Zia Records. Oh. So I would say my problem as a high schooler was I was just, I had very, I was like an indie kid um, mm-hmm. and I had very pretentious preferences <laughs> to, be, to confess here. Um, awesome. You know, very like against the mainstream, you know, mm-hmm. don't listen to Mariah Carey, you know, sorts of things. Um, so yeah, so basically like uh, pop is all the stuff that would not be at Zia Records. <laughs> okay. So Okay, so at, at one point in high school, you had this like pretentious music taste, but yeah. like today you wanted to talk I still about- do, I should say, I should say, <laughs> I still, deep down inside me, I still do. Yeah. <laughs> that child, that, that youthful person is still part of me. Sure, but now you do like pop music or like top 40 stuff? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I, I would say that like, um, it is, it is a guilty pleasure. <laughs> and I recognize that my uh, pretentious inclinations are um, wrong, are a sin. <laughs> and that wow. uh, that's like an egoism there that okay. I feel uh, is not good about me. And so I just want to make sure um, that I developed an appreciation for pop music. Um, and Mar- 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 that early Mariah Car- Carey is really good now. <laughs> Okay, so you like made an active choice to like expand your tastes and not have such a like pretentious um, niche music love. Yeah, I would say it's probably like more of a um, conscious decision to not to not be so pretentious in my music taste and then open myself to uh, the beauty of pop music in ways that I was closed off to before. Okay. Uh, Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, I was, I was never, I'm, I feel like I just definitely had like pretentious taste in other areas, but music was not one of them. Like same thing with like books. I mean, I try to read widely, but I'm very easily entertained. And that like goes for music. Like I I learned like later on, like people like hated on like Nickelback and I loved Nickelback. Like, I don't remember if that would have been like middle school or high school, but like I like jammed out to the like the wanna be a rock star song. I just thought that was so good. And I like felt music in my soul. And I so I didn't have much much taste at all. <laughs> See, I, I should also say that like I do, it's not that I'm just like, oh, anything on the radio is good. I mean, I do think that there's like good music, good pop music, <laughs> bad pop music. You know, it's it's um and I'm very opinionated <laughs> when it comes okay. to um yeah what counts as good and what counts as bad but I would just say yeah. like I have no more I have tried to kill within myself that fascist impulse to to say like this is the only this sub of music is the only one that's good right yeah I can yeah I can understand that I think that there's also like as far as like some people who say that they like know what is good music and bad music like I I often witness what I have labeled as like sexism, like if like a female rapper, they will like judge way harsher than male rappers. Or like when WAP came out, like people were like, "Oh, this is so bad. We can't be talking about this." And I'm, and I saw like counter arguments saying like, "Do you listen to any of like contemporary rap music written by men?" Like it is very explicit like <laughs> and just or because, like yeah exactly or like ice cube back in the day i mean it's just <laughs> right and like just because it's talking about it's a woman talking about female pleasure then oh man then it's then it's a problem hello beloved baddies a quick break to tell you that this episode is sponsored by the center for art humor and soul a nonprofit that supports and amplifies the voices of edgewalkers through art that catalyzes change, laughter that brings us together, and soul awakening to the creative spark within us. The support from the Center for Art, Humor, and Soul has meant the world to this podcast, so I highly encourage you to check out their website, arthumorandsoul.com, 
to see their other featured artists and projects. If you want to support the podcast, you can check out our Patreon or get in touch. Now I'll let you get back to this episode of Called to be Bad. Um, I, uh, I remember my parents, I think particularly my dad, voicing concern about the types the type of music we were listening to. It, there was never this sense of like, you can't listen to this music. It was just like, do you realize what these lyrics are saying? And like, what do you do with that? Like uh, kind of this implication that these lyrics are forming you, whether you realize it or not. And I wonder, like, I'm very curious how, how much of that is true. Like if, if um, there's any sort of like like on the, the darker side of like profane pop music, like it does this like perpetuate sexism or misogyny or, you know, even racism or is it like just music? And like, cause like at the time, like, I don't, like you said, like, I don't think I understood the lyrics. Like I was just singing along, like, um, but I just had this very, and like arguing with my dad of like, no, this doesn't bother me. This doesn't change me. Like, it's just music. And I, I'm just like, as an adult, I don't, I don't know who I agree with my dad or me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I remember that too. I mean, uh, the language I remember hearing at, it wasn't from my parents. It was probably from like my youth group leaders or whatever, but, mm. uh, garbage in garbage out. <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, I even remember going to some friends taking me to, this was in California, up to a um, Calvary Chapel um, Friday night youth group meeting where mm -hmm. it was all about how um, music, all of this like quote unquote secular music was, um, yeah, turning us into people that were like not good for like messing with our heads basically. Right. And they right. want, they Perhaps showed they like, say yeah. that again. I said corrupting you. Yes, corrupting yeah. me. Yeah. And yeah. that it was like demonic even. So mm -hmm. they would play like, I don't know, we watched this video, this new, I can't even remember what the film was called, but basically trying to argue that like Zed Le Led Zeppelin's album, like you play it backward and it's all like. Right. Zeppelin. Yeah. Or like The Doors, like Jim Morrison was, you know, basically like a channeling um, spirits of the dead or mm -hmm. something like that. Anyhow, I remember all that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Oh, but Go ahead. What I was going to say about that in terms of the garbage in garbage and how it affects us, like, I think the, I think that assumes an anthropology, uh, like a, how our minds, bodies, how we work, where we have no um, ability to resist. So it assumes that like the garbage in garbage out model of human relationship to stimuli basically assumes that um, we are defenseless against whatever influences affect us and that there's a direct correlation between what I take in and how I process it and what it produces in me. Um, whereas I, it is just as likely that uh, we respond to a stimuli either as acceptance or resistance. You mm -hmm. know, like it's not an, it, it assumes very little about human agency that we are not agents of our own lives to say that somehow a particular stimuli always affects everybody in the same way, you know? <laughs> Which is kind of like aligns with, um, I think that this is true, like uh, an evangelical view that like, um, uh, kind of like the, the temptation view of that, like we are, we are powerless to kind of resist temptation um, and, and resist like the devil speaking in our ear or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I've, yeah heard no, exactly. people, I, I've heard a lot of people who are kind of deconstructing more evangelical beliefs say like, I'm having to learn how to trust myself now and trust that I like trust my own in instincts and trust my own choices. Um, so I'm curious how you see uh, profane pop music relating to the work you do in the church and like your theology, like, um, do you draw connections between how you think of God and certain music you listen to? Yeah, no, that's a, um, I mean, yeah, on a very like basic level, like it's not unusual for a song like, you know, Justin Bieber or Britney Spears, um, Lauren Hill already mentioned, Cardi B even uh, showing yeah. up in a sermon. Yeah, um, oh, nice. But, um, but I'd say like more in general, in terms of like a theolo uh, theological, I don't know, take, 
I guess, on it all is that I feel like there's a tendency for um, at least the Christianity I grew up with, which was very, um, I mean, not quite evangelical, but mm -hmm. I mean, because it was like an immigrant household and so it doesn't quite match, but pretty socially conservative and wary of the wider world, probably mm -hmm. would be a good way to put it, um, that there's a way of thinking about church as, as an enclave. You know, it's like this um, protective circle of influence and control and possession of a subculture um, mm -hmm. that lets us escape from what's going on out there because out there it's bad and scary or whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think that like pop music, uh, pop profane music is, is a way of um, making sure that we acknowledge the way that we live mm -hmm. beyond ourselves and beyond our community that like, you know, that we're worldly people basically. I mean, we live in this world yeah. um, with our neighbors and um, all of our, and that culture that all of us are creating affects everybody. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that we're like, as social beings, as social creatures, we're just involved in all that and we should acknowledge it and, and discern maybe with our neighbors um, outside of our faith communities, like what boundaries are helpful and what are not, instead of just saying all of that is bad. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, it's it's bringing up, and I and I was gonna say this earlier, so I'm glad you kept going along the lines. It reminds me of uh, ideas of like um, holiness and purity, and how like the church wants to like guard itself from anything that is like impure or unholy, or at least like traditional or some traditions um, believe that. Like I um, heard this idea that it's just like like a little bit of shit pollutes. You know, if you have a little bit of shit in something, it pollutes the whole thing. And, and I feel like that's also um, been used to talk about like music, like you think it's just one song, but no, it infiltrates everything. And I mean, that's applied to like impurity culture and like virginity. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think we are due for a new model for how the church interacts with the world and that, you know, um, the phrase that popped in my head was we are one but that sounded like really cheesy i mean like it, there's not just this neat division between church and world um yeah do you want to say say more about that or yeah i mean yeah no i think that's um yeah so like you know the the old baptist preacher line mm -hmm. is that the line between the, the church and the world passes through the hearts of every believer oh um, interesting yeah, and so just the sense of like it. Uh, I mean, or, or old church language, sinner. And we're all, you know, there's sinner and saints. Mm -hmm. All of us are sinners and saints at the same time. So I don't know if it's um, a new. I don't know if we need something new, but it's maybe just trying to remember what has been mm -hmm. said and embodied in the past. Um, okay. I do think that the at least in the United States, the uh, moral majority. Um, um, Christians partnership with the Republican Party mm -hmm. to create a particular kind of culture around some of the values that you just mentioned um, has deceived us into thinking that this is the way it's always been. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, because it's always establishing itself as like, um, you know, we're a traditional, we're for the traditional values of what Christianity or whatever, but they're just making up all that stuff. I mean, it's just, <laughs> It's just whatever, like you know, Nixon and Reagan wanted, um, and they got together with Jerry Falwell and Billy Graham and decided to say, like, this is the world we want to create, and we'll just frame it as like nostalgic when really nothing has ever been that clear. Hmm. Yeah, so it's it's very closely tied to politics, like the the yeah, interesting. Well, yeah, I mean one. Yeah, one place to point to would be, I mean, so this language about purity and holiness and profane um, are, I mean, these are as old as the Bible. Um, so like a really important book, Mary Douglas wrote this book called Purity and Danger, mm -hmm. um, where, I mean, she just explores how this, there's nothing wrong with the binary. It's just always how you discern the edges and what works for a society. Mm -hmm. um, so like, you know, purity codes, 
in uh, the uh, Torah, let's say, are important. You know, they're like right. life affirming, sustaining things that you got to do so you don't die in the desert. Right. <laughs> um, and yeah, obviously they get abused and like taken in bad directions, but, it, but like the claim to say that, hey, you know what? There's this stuff out there that hurts us and we need to stay away from it. We shouldn't eat it or whatever is just, we're always making those decisions. You know, like today, each of us have, have those like uh, purity, danger, distinctions that we're always trying to navigate um, as part of our lives. And that it just, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is the church gets it wrong if we think that we're the only people concerned with this, <laughs> that somehow we're the only people concerned about what is healthy for our spiritual lives, bodily lives, that um, we actually develop harmful practices if we cut ourselves off from the ways that all of this wisdom is being discerned in communities wider than ourselves. Um, I think maybe like one of the most horrific examples of how the church gets this wrong and how it like damages lives and especially around sexual purity mm -hmm. is all of this clergy abuse scandals you know from um very hierarchical traditions like the roman catholic church to very low church traditions like the baptists um that feels like an enclave saying like you know what we're the ones that should be able to decide what counts as good and bad pure and unpure mm -hmm. um sacred and secular and we don't need to listen to all those other conversations we could handle this in-house and right. that turns out to be very damaging to people yeah oh man yeah for sure i mean th those words that you're naming that is like the heart of what i want to talk about here on the podcast you know like yeah the church has, has tried to, to to make those distinctions and it's not historically not done, not done a great job of it. Uh, and what, what's also interesting is like Jesus was, he, I'm, I'm drawing from Richard uh, Beck's book, um, Unclean, which he, he draws from Mary Douglas's work um, about purity. And he talks about, um, uh, um, oh my gosh, what's it called? Uh, disgust, the psychology mm. of disgust and points out how Jesus like intentionally crosses these lines, um, these taboo lines um, in order to like bring people from the margins. Um, and so like we have this model of how to like navigate these lines in Jesus, but yet still somehow there's a break there. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I think that's important just to, yeah, to maybe recognize how Jesus is working within a the framework of his faith and trying to figure out um, what people have abused in terms of boundaries, mm -hmm. um, what boundaries people have invented that just weren't there um, in scripture. Or boundaries for the sake of boundaries rather than like having it there be a reason behind the, the rule like Sabbath laws. Um, and then and, and like doing things like saying like, this is my blood poured out for you. When like the oldest rule one of the oldest rules was do not drink the lifeblood of an animal. And then he's like, here, this is my blood. And you're like, Jesus, what are you doing? Like, what are you trying to say here? Um, I wrote an article <laughs> in seminary talking about comparing Jesus and vampires. Ooh, um, nice. Instead of like drinking blood. Um, anyways, I, I can't decide if I am proud or <laughs> I'm not ashamed, but it's, you know, yeah, whatever. <laughs> But uh, wait, why, why you should be proud. That's great. Vampires. And I, I love that. That's awesome. Well, it's just I mean, like, hopefully, <laughs> go ahead. I was gonna say, hopefully involved like a very like uh, in-depth close reading of, of Twilight or something like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, did I draw from Twilight? Um, well, I did. Okay. So I was really, I'm really love um, taking like supernatural stories and like tropes and like pairing them with like the Bible. So like, I also, in the same article, I compared Augustine with werewolves and this like fear of the body um, and fear of like our uh, animal selves, basically. And then um, Paul and zombies with his talk of like um, the bodily resurrection. Um, and then I did Jesus and vampires. Um, and then a different project I did was um, talking about um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and power dynamics um, within like vampires and like why we're so obsessed with vampires. Uh, I did a lot of 
stuff on vampire. I just think it's super fascinating. Um, how did I get into this? Oh, because just Jesus and blood and taboo and crossing lines. There we go. Yeah, no, it was, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was really fun work. Um, and I think there's something there. Like, I think Jesus did this intentionally. Like he crossed those lines intentionally and what we draw from it, I think could speak helpfully into these conversations of like, you know, can Christians listen to music that uh, crosses boundaries and makes us uncomfortable? Um, Just a note on the Jesus part. I mean, I think it's, this is where I think it gets tricky, at least for me, um, because it's complicated to think about whether or not Jesus is, um, I mean, yeah, like what you're saying, Jesus is definitely um, uh, breaking social codes, pushing Mm -hmm. boundaries. Um, I think what it gets complicated for me is to figure out if the boundaries that he's transgressing are social boundaries um, invented by power brokers in society, or if there are, if, if like it's scriptural boundaries. So mm-hmm. I recognize that it is, a, um, it is a temptation ever since, I don't know, like, I, well, I should say since, uh, since the division between, since, Christ, since the church broke off from the synagogue in the second, third centuries, um, to say that like all the laws um, in the Old Testament are bad and Jesus right. shows us that we should be breaking them. Um, and the way that that produces a kind of anti-Judaism um, mm-hmm. in the church, which is bad, um, which is also actually very evangelical. So mm-hmm. evangelicalism is very much about like, you know, like this distinction between the law and the gospel, um, let's say. So I don't know. So I, I worry a little bit about I mean, I don't know. I think it needs to be taken case by case about like what exactly Jesus is doing and um, what boundaries he's breaking. So I, to go back to Mary Douglas, Mm. I mean, Mary Douglas is very helpful on this just to say how the boundaries outlined in the, um, in the Torah are life-giving and to cross over some of them actually is a, is a way of like giving yourself to death, which is bad, which is what God wants to protect people from. Yeah. So that the purity, danger and purity and danger. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like blood, let's say, mm-hmm. um, and rules around blood. So yeah. So like purity and danger. And then her other book on Leviticus actually is super good. Oh, uh, I haven't read that one. I think it's called Leviticus and literature. Okay. And yeah, I would, I would say that she is that uh, Richard Beck mm-hmm. kind of plays fast and loose with her mm-hmm. scholarship and that of Jacob Milgram, which all of this is indebted to, uh, who's a rabbi who wrote a lot of commentaries on Leviticus and numbers. Um, Yeah, I think probably the most helpful person these days who's writing about this is um, uh, Matthew Thiessen Nation. And he wrote a very readable book like that I've told people at church to read called um, Jesus and the Forces of Death. Mm. And he just kind of explores the way that Jesus is primarily... Uh, a Jewish figure who is trying to remind people that the laws are a protection against death Mm. and that what it means to be a faithful person, to be part of the people of God is to put your life um, in resistance to the forces of death all around us. Mm. Yeah. makes sense to me. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And now now I want to go get that book. I think I, I saw it and like wanted to get it, but held off. Um, yeah, I, I find this, that whole topic super fascinating. And, and you're right, we need to hold the intention, like, uh, Jesus was crossing boundaries, but that doesn't mean that, like, uh, yeah, he just dismissed all that, you know, he's very formed by, by these laws. Um, yeah, I, yeah, that's a good, it's helpful. Yeah, so, like, I mean, boundaries, so I guess maybe what, what I'm trying to get at <laughs> is that, uh, um, crossing boundaries as like a transgressive act mm. isn't necessarily an automatic good. It right. just depends on the boundary, you know, like, yeah. it, so let's yeah. talk about the boundary and see like, oh yeah, why is this here? Is it good? Is it bad? Should we transgress it? Should we not? But like to situate ourselves as just like, we are transgressive people, mm. I think misses the point of the discernment required to figure out a healthy life for all of us. 
Right. Yeah. It, it, um, I heard somewhere, I don't know who, who said it, but like the, the idea that the, the, the rebel is still bound to the rules or the people who are making the rules because they're just they're just situating situating themselves in opposition to that but it's still bound there has to be an opposing force um and so you know they they it seems like they are free because they are like rejecting things but they're still bound to that uh now i'm just repeating myself but yeah you you get you get the idea oh i love that i think you're exactly right i think that's perfect yeah that makes that's exactly what i'm trying to say that that yeah that's a good Right. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And that fits in with like our talk of like music, because I think a lot of people turn to music to kind of like you were saying, like you had your rebellious stage. I think people turn to music to have this almost vicarious experience of of rebellion, of pushing the boundaries of like, this is what it means to be good or Christian. And so then they enter into the space of like that, that those they're bound by those rules. Um, but I'm curious, just like natural curiosity. I don't know if this is like leads to any profound commentary or anything, but I'm curious what your favorite pop songs are and why you like them. And mm. yeah. I have like an extensive palette of, of music, of pop music, of indie music, of sub genres. Like I like so much of it, but there's also music that I just, I don't like. So like that Lumineers, I just, I don't like, I think they're a rip off band, but I like, <laughs> music in that like folk music around here um uh in the south in the mountains i mean it's just amazing stuff and really good um and yeah so yeah i'll listen to that i'll listen to cardi b mm -hmm. um but yeah like taylor swift i mean i preached a sermon on taylor swift or britney spears um j balvin i love j balvin okay um, so do you think Christians could benefit from listening to profane pop music? Like, is, is there room for this in the church? What would that look like? Yeah, I mean, I, I, so call, I mean, I also, yeah, I think so. I mean, like, I've had so many Britney Spears sermons in a certain era of my life where um, I, after a pastoral review, in the, I'd asked one, the congregation one question in part of the pastoral review, which was like, does Isaac have a theology? If so, what is it? And one person wrote, Isaac's theology is everything that Britney Spears has sang about. <laughs> <laughs> That's Isaac's how theology. you know you have made it. If someone yeah. answers a question like that, you, you have made it. Yeah, I, I'm just, I'm trying to break down this idea that like pastors can't listen to this kind of profane music because of these moments I'd be sitting in my car listening to music and I'd be like if my congregation only knew what I would listen to like they wouldn't they would view me differently as a pastor and 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 I just just I don't know humanize I guess pastors and like pastors can love Taylor Swift too um so I ask um almost everyone that comes on the show uh, what would you say if someone said that you were a bad pastor or Christian or Mennonite or whatever for liking profane pop music? Mm. I'd tell them a story and I'd tell them this, <laughs> this story. Um, so I, um, for a while there, multiple Mennonite conventions, I would come up with a playlist mm. on S Spotify or whatever it was. And it would be my, in preparation for the convention. And I would send it out to, uh, you know, other friends, Mennonite pastors, folks I'm in community with. And I'm like, all right, here's our, basically like our mixtape to prep for conventions. And this was definitely, um, I think it probably started in the infamous Kansas City um, mm -hmm. where the LGBTQ, um, resolution was up for conversation debate and we knowing that we just needed something to get <laughs> to prepare ourselves for all of that and yeah so i started uh, these became popular mm -hmm. and when um hannah heinzinger became the editor at the mennonite she actually asked me to um i think maybe it was one or two conventions to come up with like playlists for conventions or for mennonite stuff basically and so then i was like writing playlists and uh, this kind of spread f beyond like people that I'm in community with to mm. a wide variety of Mennonites. And then I had 
one person come up to me at a convention who I didn't know, um, had a long talk with him. And he was just like, you have somehow figured out a way to discern goodness in this music that I've never listened to. Um, he's a little bit older than me. Um, for, and you know, music that I don't, we don't allow in our house. Mm -hmm. And it means that like, I just have a hard time engaging these conversations with my kid. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to talk with him uh, about the music oh. you listen to? <laughs> interesting that is not what i expected you to say yeah huh at, at convention uh, we sat in the corner he like introduced me to his you know high school kid and we just talked about like music and the music he listens to and what it brings up in his life and how to think about that and i don't know it felt like a very meaningful productive um hopefully i was helpful so i would say that listening to Profane pop music enables pastoral care in ways that mm -hmm. uh, um, that some people aren't able to do. Right. Yeah. That's. I was exactly going to say like that's a pastoral moment that you could like right. sit with that kid and and be able to connect. Um, I love that. And he wasn't saying like tell my kid not to listen to this. He was saying like hey you understand this music so you can talk to my kid about it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. Um, I feel like we should have brought some samples of me. It feels like this requires like some kind of playlist. I should have done my, um, it's my fault. I actually should have made a playlist to help shape this conversation. Wait, wait, wait. And I apologize. No, but can you still do that? Can you like make a playlist <laughs> and we'll like link it below uh, when we- Oh yeah, yeah. That would be so cool. Make a mix. Okay, yeah, I'll include, that's great. I'll include like the songs that I got in trouble listening to. Yeah. And wait, maybe, can I, maybe can I make my own? Oh and yeah. Like have both? Oh, yes. I love this. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right, we're gonna oh, do it. Cool, now I feel like, now I feel a little bit of pressure to like say, oh, these are my profane, po <sighs> you know? Well, it's I also, I mean, I, I take the, the mixtape as a very serious project too. This is no messing ah. around. Like this. Oh no, this will take me hours of work. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this is holy work. This yeah. is holy, holy work. So Isaac, would be it would it be okay if I blessed you and um, all the viewers and listeners? Yes, please. <laughs> um, Isaac and um, all you baddies out there, um, may you go from this podcast with uh, in one ear pop music and all the wonderful things that come along with living in this colorful musical world, um, and also in the other ear. Um, the voice of God who created us to um, love and experiment with music and all the delights and problems and everything else that come with it. Um, so yeah, may you go in that delightful paradox. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I, I, it's kind of hard to come up with a blessing that has to do with pop music. I was like, I think I'm sweating a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, thank you, Isaac, for being on the show. Uh, this was a delight. I love talking about this kind of stuff. Yeah, this is great. Thank you for inviting me. I've loved it. Great. That's all for this episode of Called to be Bad. Keep being your bad, beautiful selves, and I will see you next time.